mood on board of that plane, though. You know you're going to Vietnam. Very somber. Uh, I mean, a lot of people were really worried about it. You know, I think my attitude was come what may. Besides that, it was an 1140. I was going to go sit in an air-conditioned talk and put pins on a map. <laughs> and what happened to your, your designation at 1140? Um, well, when I arrived at the 90th replacement battalion in, uh, in Saigon, they, uh, uh, it was just after they had uh, a big uh, fight up in, in I-Corps ripcord, the, the firebase ripcord. And it was probably about three or four clicks away from Hamburger Hill, if you've seen that movie. But it was basically the same sort of thing, only Ripcord was a bigger base. And the, uh, they were defending that. Most of, the, uh, most of the people that were off around the perimeter of the base came into contact. And a lot of, a lot of people were lost. There was no press. It was never released. You never read it in our, you know, on the news, the 5 o'clock news or 6 o'clock news. You never saw it. And it wasn't on Armed Forces Times because they had blanked it out because of Hamburger Hill. They had uh, received such bad press about Hamburger Hill that they didn't want to, the 101st Airborne did not want that to reoccur. So anyhow, um, back to the 90th replacement. They had a list and they said, um, Sergeant Funk over here. And he said, you're going to the 101st Airborne. And I said, well, that's not too bad. And, you know, talking uh, and, you know, up in I-Corps is fine. <laughs> it's air conditioned. <laughs> so I flew out, of, uh, flew out of Saigon heading north up there to the DMZ between, uh, between Way and Quantry was Camp Evans. I went up to Camp Evans, went through in-country training one week, and then reported to the, the Charlie Company. Second of the 506th. And they said, okay, uh, let's see here. We don't need anybody in the talk. We need sergeants out in the field. You are now relegated to 11B40, which was infantry. Nothing I could do about it. Fate, once again. So I guess about a day or two later, I packed a rucksack, was issued an M16, got on a bird, and flew out to Firebase O'Reilly, which was probably, once again, three or four clicks from uh, Ripcord. Got my, uh, got my, uh, my combat infantry badge up there, too, because the first night up there we were hit. <laughs> but anyhow, that wasn't... My company wasn't up there. My company was still in the, in the field. My company, the company that I belonged to, uh, was still out in the field. And they were destined to come up to O'Reilly in two days. So I stayed up on O'Reilly until they came through the wire. They humped up through the wire up to the top of the hill. And they said, Sergeant Funk, you've got, this, you've got this squad. You're a squad leader now. Well, I'd only been out in the field for, what was it, a total of four days? And here I'm thinking, well, I've got all these guys that have been through combat. You know, they've, they've risked their lives. You know, they've seen much more than I have. They've, some of them have been here for nine or ten months, getting short and ready to go home. And they're going to put me in charge of these guys? And it was like, don't worry about it. There's only two left. So I took, uh, took command of a squad with two guys left. And I looked at these guys. One was shorter than the other. One, one had six months in, uh, in country. The other one was close to 10 months. And I called them aside. I said, look, guys, I'm not going to claim I'm kind of a combat veteran. I'm not going to claim that I really know what I'm doing. I said, I don't know the ropes. They, in the States, they teach you conventional warfare for the most part. I said, I don't know what I'm doing. I said, so... If I come up and ask you to do something and you know it's wrong and it's, you know, it's contrary to the way I should act, kick me in the butt. <laughs> and these guys took me verbatim. <laughs> when I screwed up, they were right on, they were right on top of me. Um, about six days later, 
maybe it was four days later, I, I don't recall exactly, um, I got the rest of my squad. They filled up the squad with, uh, with new guys. Cherries, as they were called, <laughs> you know. I had, a, I had a squad full of cherries, including myself and these two guys. And rather than send us back to the rear so we could get organized, get to know each other, become acquainted and that sort of thing, and get briefed on to, as to what's going on, I said, nope, you're, pack up your stuff, which was in a, uh, which was in a foxhole along the perimeter of O'Reilly. Pack up your stuff. We're going through the wire, and we're going out looking for mortars around Ripcord. So that was my first night in the field, heading back forward for Ripcord. And uh, the people that were left, the old timers that were left there, were just nervous as heck. You know, any twig would pop at night. You'd hear a hand grenade, you'd hear a poop. And go, come here, here comes another hand grenade, and they throw it up against a tree, and they bounce off the tree, and you're down in your hole and cover up, and <laughs> kaboom. But th that, was, uh, that was about a about month, I guess, before we went back to a stand down, a real stand down back at Fort, uh, Camp Evans and had any kind of real briefings or anything else. We were just winging it, playing it by ear. In that uh, first month, did you have any major contacts, major firefights? Uh... Just the one up on O'Reilly and, uh, and occasional shots here and there, you know, snipers. And I might add that during this period of time, um, Chuck Norris, who the, the, the movie star, his brother, his younger brother was killed. And I think it was Bravo Company, who was our sister company, working on the other side of a perimeter, or the other side of a hill. They were going on around one side, we were going around the other, and uh, I guess a, a sniper got him. So, yeah, there was contact, but it wasn't, it wasn't like World War II. You're in a foxhole, and, you know, the masses are coming. It was this clandestine firing from here and there, and, you know, you just never knew. And booby traps. What kind of booby traps were you running into? What, did the, what kind of stuff did they set up? Most of them were what we called toe poppers. And there were enough, there were enough C4 or dynamite or whatever they were using. It was chai com stuff. Um, but it was enough so that if you stepped on it, it would blow your leg off from oh, about halfway down your knee to your ankle. You know, you would you would lose that your foot and everything else, and I lost, eh, I'd say at least four or five people to that. And I was kind of a casualty of that too, but I didn't know it at the time. Um, I was a squad leader, so I never. Well, I wouldn't say I never walked point, but that's not true. I would walk point if everybody was grousing about walking point. I say, okay, I'll do it, but I won't, when I tell you to walk point tomorrow, I don't want to hear a word. And so I'd walk point. Um, but anyhow, generally speaking, I would have somebody in front of me, the, uh, a point man. Then I would follow, followed by a, uh, my RTO, and then the rest of the squad. And then a lieutenant would be embedded in there somewhere. Um, on two occasions, the guy, my point man, hit those booby traps, and it would throw me up in the air, and I'd land back on my back, and boom. Um, another time, the other sergeant, there was another sergeant, my backup sergeant, he, uh, he was delayed coming across a, uh, an LZ. I was walking point across that one and he was delayed and I didn't know that he had stopped to stop, talk to people in second platoon who had stopped on the other far side of the LZ. So I went back up looking for him and I see him, he's got a big smile on his face and he's walking across and all of a sudden, boom, down he goes. And I went out to the LZ and I was holding him. Um, his R RTO, because he had an RTO, he was training to take the, uh, the other squad, the second squad, came out, and we were busy medevacking him when the RTO hit one. And that was right next to my head. It was like kaboom. <laughs> and so we had two of the guys down there. Um, we had one medic, but the company medic was standing on the side, and I said, come on out here and... He was a little reluctant to step out on that. I, I don't blame him at all, reluctant to step out on that. And so I walked back across the LZ and I said, look, this guy was big. I mean, he was like 
six feet tall. I said, where I put my foot, you put your foot. And if I make it, you know you're going to make it. Well, we need to get out and help these guys and get them medevaced. And uh, so that's where we went across the, uh, the uh, LZ. Me with my five-foot legs or <laughs> and this six-footer tiptoeing <laughs> across. <laughs> But anyhow, that was one of my worst fears um, over there it was not that I would be killed. My worst fear was that I'd be maimed. I didn't want that. Become a hindrance, you know, back in the States or not be able to, you know, be incapacitated. I just didn't want that. And so that was always my worst fear. And I fear those booby traps. What's it like... Uh you're losing friends like that and you're so young yourself but how do you process that or do you uh... you don't have time to you don't have time to um after that that other sergeant that backup sergeant that i had in my squad after he lost his leg they said okay this this lz that were it was an old lz we never should have been there in the first place but i was ordered to cross it we never should have gone on that lz so let's blow another one on this adjacent hill we went up there and got ambushed. I mean, RPGs coming in and, and uh, AK-47s and that whole thing. Um, so like I said, I didn't have time to reflect upon, hey, this, this friend of mine just lost his leg. And actually, uh, actually, both of the guys were friends of mine. And they were both sergeants, <laughs> RTO sergeant. Um, anyhow, I didn't have time to reflect upon it. You just didn't have time because you had all the rest of the people and you know okay get back to your get back to your little base camp area or the, the far side of the lz and all right sergeant funk take a riff out this way you know and so we'd go back out and you know down the hill and down the valley looking for the guys that were uh had just uh, fired us up on that lz but so like i say i didn't really have time to contemplate and you said, so you spent that first month out there and you had kind of sporadic fire and stuff. Then you came back and actually got, you know, a briefing or you got kind of an idea of what, what's going on. And meet the people in, in the other platoons and and find out, oh, this is the captain of your company. <laughs> I don't know if I ever saw him out there in the field before we went out. Because, I mean, we would work in platoon size. Um Anyhow, we were platoon sides, so one platoon would go this way, one would go up, one would stay down low, and so I'd, I'd see the lieutenants, but I wouldn't see the other, uh, the captain and headquarters company, because they were somewhere in between or up above or who knows where. And uh, so after you do that, you get, uh, you know, kind of a, a, you meet all the guys, meet your company commander. Um, what kind of operations do you start doing after that? Search and destroy. That was that was what it was all about, was search and destroy. They decided they were going to rename it to something else, and I can't remember what it was, something a little less uh, less hostile sounding, but it was still search and destroy, and they wanted body counts. If you could get a confirmed body count, then you got a free day at Eagle Beach, which was on the coast. You know, they had an ocean. They'd fly you there and a day and a night on Eagle Beach. I never spent a day there. Never had it confirmed. I was always, doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> did you get some? No, I don't know. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm not stupid enough to care. <laughs> what did you think about fighting a war that way where you're, you're fighting not over land, it's over how many people uh, you're able to kill? Did, did you have any thoughts about that at the time? It seemed ridiculous because we'd go after a hilltop and we'd take a hilltop and we'd, we'd set up bob wire and we'd be up there for uh reconnaissance for maybe about a week or so and then it was pack up and leave and all the all the the blood sweat and tears of getting up there was for naught <laughs> you abandoned it you went up you abandoned it you didn't hold that position it wasn't something like in world war ii where you 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 won a town you fought for a town and you stayed in that town now this was a hilltop in the jungle up in the uh, Shaw Valley is where I spent most of my time. Um, 
that and a little time up on the DMZ. But uh, most of it was the Asha Valley, and it's just all jungle and hills, mountains. Kind of like out my back door. <laughs> like, like I say, my fear was being injured, and so the, the booby traps and the LZs and, and that sort of thing, um, that's what is memorable to me. And I know on the last booby trap that, uh, that blew me up in the air and blew me back down, I was relegated uh, to be medevaced out. And they couldn't get a medevac in, so I was going to wait until the next uh, supply ship came in. And I couldn't carry my rucksack on my back, so I'd carried it over my arm like this and, and my M16 on the other side, and I was walking down like this. Um, there was a sergeant that took my place. He was an E6, took my place as squad leader, and I think it was no more than two days later. He uh, ended up walking straight up, a, leading the squad right up a, a trail and hit a big booby trap. It was like uh, probably a 105 round that had been rigged and, and booby trap set up as a booby trap. And he lost everything from the waist down. Um, totally, and all, you know, because I was walking towards the back. I was a slack man, and I went up front, and Isaiah was just screaming, and nothing left from the from the waist down. He went out. They medevaced him out to a to a ship, a, a Red Cross ship, and from what I understand, he lived three days. I might mention that that last summer or last, not summer, but last winter, they um, read all the names on the Vietnam Wall, Memorial Wall in Washington, D.C. They do it every five years, I believe. And I went out there and I read his name. Only, you know, normally you go out there and get a list of names. And I said, no, I just want to read one name. And I read his. I just had to get it off my chest because that should have been me, not him. Anyhow, I, I spent my last month on bunker, go, bunker uh, duty, bunker guard duty, head of a, uh, the line for Charlie Company out on the perimeter on Camp Evans. I got my orders one day, and it said, you're a free man. Report down to, the, uh, down to Saigon, to back down to the 90th replacement, I think it was. I don't remember exactly, but head for Saigon. There's a plane with your name on it. And... I thought, this is great. And I went back to the company area, and I said, here's my, my orders, and they stamped everything out. And, and I said, okay, we got a problem, though. You're going to have to find your own way down to Saigon. <laughs> Everybody was up north on the DMZ for Lamsung, uh, what is it, 719, I believe it was called. 719 is when the Vietnamese went into Cambodia. And um, we were... All the aircraft was were supporting them, whether it be transport or whether it be armaments or whatever. But anyhow, there was nothing available. I said, you can find your way to Saigon, you can go home. So I packed up my duffel bag, threw it over my shoulder, had my uh, folder with my orders in, in the other hand, walked out the gate at Camp Evans onto Highway 1 and started hitchhiking. <laughs> <laughs> and I hitchhiked down to Da Nang. Da Nang, I got a, a short flight on a Huey. I don't remember where I was. It was some little base or something off of uh, Highway 1, and then I ended up hitchhiking again. But I, I finally made my way, my own way down to Saigon and got on that fire, flying, flying Tiger plane <laughs> and was home the next day. I didn't expect a hero's welcome, but I didn't expect to be flipped off. We flew into uh, into, into uh, Lewis again, Fort Lewis, and went to SeaTac. And for some reason, they made us wear our, our greens, dress greens. So there we are, stuck out like a like a, a sore thumb. You know, we're walking through the airport, and all these people, protesters, are there. You know, and. and the girls saying they wish I was dead and um, people pretending to spit on me and flipping me off. 
and they had a contingent of MPs <laughs> along either side to keep us from uh, reacting. They said, look, you guys want to end up in the brig back there at uh, Fort Lewis? Get involved. <laughs> but no, that was that way all the way to San Francisco. And then San Francisco, I took a bus back home to Roseville, California. The same thing. Nobody acknowledged me, or if they did, it was with a very hateful look. Got to my hometown. I'm hitchhiking. I've got my duffel bag over my, my it's, it's about, the, the bus station's about five miles, six miles from my parents' house. I had a duffel bag over my shoulder. I had my dress greens on, and all I wanted to do was get home and get this stuff off, and, you know, I'm trying to hitchhike, and people are flipping me off, and cat calls, and all kinds of stuff, and I just, you know, I, I was definitely anti-war. I didn't agree with the Vietnam, the Vietnam War. I think, don't think we had a right to be there. I think that started way back with Ho Chi Minh in World War II, and we promised to help rid the French. And then you had Deng Wen Phu and you know, on and on. But um, I, wasn't against, I wasn't against the troops. I was pro-troop against the war. And I didn't really expect to be treated like that. So I took, got home, took all that military stuff off, threw it in a, in a footlocker, and there it sat for the next um, 40 years or whatever it was. I uh, went back to school. I was hired as a, uh, as a uh, computer developer, uh, software developer, by Ross Perot. He was the one that ran for president. And uh, he hired me as a way of saying thank you for your service. And uh, anyhow, I was living in San Francisco. I had four other roommates, guys, and we were pretty close. We went out and partied together and went into town. And, you know, <laughs> uh, we had parties at the house. And, you know, I got to know them very well. In fact, I'm still in touch with three of them. Um, every, uh, every six months, I'll, I'll, I'll be on the phone with them. But yeah, that's another story. But anyhow, uh, until I until I was in got back from Iran, nobody knew that I was a, uh, a military veteran. Nobody had any idea, had a clue that I had ever served because I looked young. I guess I I looked like uh, I, I probably when I was twenty twenty five I could ca pass for nineteen. You know, because uh, Ross Perot didn't like beards or anything else. Only short hair and the whole bit. And I played the game. But um, so I looked like I was just out of out of college or just out of high school for that matter. And so none of these guys ever suspected that I would have been a sergeant in Vietnam. And then I mentioned Iran. I went over to Iran with Ross Perot and we evacuated it out with the, when the Shah fell. In the middle of the night, clandestinely <laughs> down to the airport, get on a plane, a dark plane, and out we went. Um, but anyhow, it was after that, and when we moved, to, uh, my wife and I moved to, uh, to Virginia, and the wall, dedication of the wall, is when I started actually admitting that, you know, hey, yeah, I was there, I did that. And uh, now I member of the VVA. <laughs> I, wear, I wear a hat and the whole bit, you know, that was a combat veteran. And uh, I'm no longer, how can I say, ashamed of it? But I, I don't feel like I need to, to hide that aspect of my life any longer. It happened. I was there. My goal was to get everybody home, or as many as possible, in 100%. And uh, I wasn't a metal chaser. I, I didn't want badges. I didn't want anything else. The best thing... Uh, that could happen was that I saw somebody go home in one piece. And as I had mentioned earlier, before you started uh, videotaping, that uh, I went to a reunion, and one of the guys came up and put his arms around me and says, thanks for getting me home alive. And that, uh, that brought tears to my eyes. It's, uh, somehow it made it all worthwhile. I was there for a reason.